Well, we are continuing our study in Paul's first letter to Timothy called First Timothy, and uh, we're calling the series because we're going to be First and Second Timothy and Titus, which are called the pastoral epistles. Uh, and be strong in grace. And this morning is part 21, deacons retain, uh, retain the faith and reviewed. That is this morning. And I, what I want to do here before we get going here, if, if, if there's any, I know there's some deacons back there serving us, some deacons um, that, are, that are out of town right now, but if you're a deacon, you serve here as a deacon at, at, at the Potter's House, would you stand up so people can see you? Now, don't be shy, okay? We've got you know, some deacons standing around here. Okay, thank you all. We've got a lot more than that. I think we have total 22 deacons, 23 deacons, something like that. So very thankful for their service uh, to us here at the Potter's House. If you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope you do have a copy of God's Word, either in paper form or digital, I'd encourage you to take that and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be looking, uh, we're going to be reading verses 8 through 13, but specifically just looking at verses 9 and 10 this morning. But before we look at verses 9 and 10 more closely, I'd ask you to stand with me as we read God's Word for us today together, found from 1 Timothy 3, 18 through 13. Read along with me, please. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith as in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, again, we come to you at this time of our worship together uh, to worship you through the preaching of your word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to, to worship you through prayer, through song, through fellowship. But now we ask, Lord, you to do something only you can do, and that is open our minds and our hearts to receive your word to understand your word, to allow it to make us more like Jesus. So we ask you to do that now and this time. Amen. Well, in way of review, as we continue to study here through 1 Timothy, it's important to be reminded of a few things to help us put this in context. And I know some of you are jumping in and out. Some of them may be new here, so we're going to put this in context. Paul is writing this letter to, T to Timothy, who's at the church of Ephesus, if that helps you. And we'll give you a little bit more background there. Paul established the church of Ephesus in Acts 18 on his second missionary journey. And then he returned a few years later in Acts 19, and um, during his third missionary journey, and he actually stayed with the Ephesian church for three years, stayed longer with the church of Ephesus than any other church he planted. And that's important to know. If you go read the book of Ephesians, which is also written to the church of Ephesus, and, I mean, he gets deep really quick, and he, gets, he actually uh, names names and, and, and gets very involved in what's going on there because he knows the people. So that might help you even if you're reading the book of Ephesians because he spent so much time with him. Well, eventually he would be driven out of Ephesus uh, during that second, that, after his three years there, because the gospel that he had preached that God was using to change the hearts of the people was affecting the worship of the goddess Diana. People weren't buying the trinkets to offer to the goddess of Diana anymore, and they didn't like that, so they ran him out of town. And, and if you read much about Paul, he always seems to be getting run out of town. Um, and I've heard this said once before, is that I think Charles Spurgeon said this, the only problem with preachers today is nobody's trying to kill them. All right, and you can laugh at that, but it's true. All right, it's, it, it, sometimes because they're not preaching the truth. But that's what happened to Paul. He got run out of Ephesus, and eventually Paul would send his son of the faith, Timothy, to be at Ephesus. And, uh, um, and, and then Paul would write two letters. This is the first one. There's another one, obviously, called Second Timothy. And, and we're currently studying the, this first of the two letters. Paul knew that Timothy and the church of Ephesus was being overrun or at least being greatly influenced by false teachers. He needed, knew they needed to establish the church even stronger. So he sends Tim, Timothy, he call, calls him an evangelist. As we learned before, often we think of an evangelist just as a herald of the good news. But if you look at Timothy and Titus, who were both evangelists in, in, in the Bible, what they did is they went to help establish churches that were already planted. And they, he, he knew the importance of establishing solid leadership because if there was solid leadership in the church, it would help keep or it would prevent at least the, the, the greater infiltration of the false teachers in the church if there's great leaders who meet the qualifications and the characteristics of leaders. So that's why one of the reasons Paul wrote these two letters. And the Lord through Paul has given us clear instructions on who is to lead and how they're to lead in the church. 
There's, there's no, like, boy, I wonder what he means by that. And I think I've said this before, but um, Mark Twain said this one time, that it's not the things about the Bible I don't understand that give me things that I do understand that give me a problem. See, the Bible is clear. It really is. Most of the, we can understand the Bible, and these instructions here about leaders in the church are really clear. I decided to do a little search on uh, Amazon about books on church leadership. So I went in there and I just put up, I didn't do Google because you'll get like, I think it was, it was 543 billion hits on church leadership. That means about every article or if it's mentioned. So I went to Amazon, over 10,000 books on church leadership in Amazon that you can get. Over 10,000. That's a lot of books on church leadership. And I'm sure there's a lot of good ones. I've probably even read some of them. And, there, and there's even ones that are based on biblical principles, which is great. But when it comes to understanding church leadership and God's design for church leadership, the only book we need to master is the book, the Bible, God's word, when it comes to church leadership. I'm not saying they can't be helpful, but, but if we don't know, need, know this, then we'll be pulled by all kinds of things in other books. We got one book, and we need to concentrate. What does that one book say? Because ultimately, what this one book says about church leadership is the only thing that matters. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's the only thing that ultimately matters. Someone else's opinion doesn't matter, but God's truth does matter. So we want to master that. We've already covered the role and qualifications of elders. And just throw this out there again, elders. What's, what's elders? Maybe you're new and you have, we went over this quite a bit, but let me just let you know, in, in, the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the, the word elders, um, pastors, bishop, overseers, actually three Greek words, and those two words are used interchangeably for the same leadership position. So maybe some of you come from a background where you had pastors, you had a pastor and you had a deacon, and maybe you had one pastor. And I will say this, that, that, and I said this before, that no place in the New Testament do you ever find a, 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 a church that's led by a single elder or a single pastor. Never. It's always a plurality. It's always multiple. Now, they might be on staff in a sense of being paid. Maybe they're not. But it's always a plurality of elder pastors. Right? So if you want to call me pastor, that's fine. But if you call me pastor, you have to call Curtis pastor and Brian pastor and Jason pastor and Sean I and mean, all these other people who are elders in, 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 our, in, our, in our body. Um, you have to call him pastor too, which is fine. You can call us elder. You can call us hey you. All right? But we all are in the same office. And I just want to remind us of the, that, that that's what the, the New Testament clearly teaches. Uh, so I don't mean to confuse you, but to understand, okay, what's the elders? Well, we're, we're pastors. We're also overseers. And we don't use this word very much. This would be really weird to use here, bishops. That's one of the English words for a synonym here. These are the words used for this office or this, this, this role of, of, of elders in the church. And last week we began looking at the leadership role of deacons. And the, de the word deacon it literally means to serve tables. And throughout the New Testament, the word and forms of the word, it just means to serve. It's those who serve. And, and this, this role here that Paul brings up to Timothy is a specific leadership role of those who serve. Well, we did this by looking at this, just reviewing, by asking three questions and answering those three questions. First of all, where, where did deacons start? Where did they come from? Where did this whole deacons thing come from? Because you don't find it in, in the Old Testament. It's a New Testament thing. And we, we looked at Acts chapter 6, and there was a problem going on in the early church in Jerusalem. Some of the Greek-speaking Jewish widows were not getting their daily food like they were supposed to and said, hey, this is wrong. Something's wrong here. So what the apostles and the, and the congregation did, they chose seven men who were full of faith and the Holy Spirit and respected by the people to, to take care of this problem. So they came up with a way to make sure that all the widows and all the people were, were their daily needs were being met. They were being served in their physical needs. That's kind of where at least it began. They weren't called deacons, although the word de the, 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 the form of the word deacon appears three times in that passage. And we know that Paul, after he was converted, was part of the church of Jerusalem. So he saw this happen. Okay, you got the apostles, and the apostles appointed elders at the church of Jerusalem, and they had deacons. So when he went to plant churches, what did he do? He appointed elders and deacons to be leaders, or he, he helped begin to establish that teaching, and then usually would send Timothy and Titus in so they could establish elders and deacons in the churches. So uh, that, that just helps us understand where did deacons come from. That's, that's where they came from, beginning in Acts chapter 6, most likely. Well, the second question we, we, we looked at was what do deacons do? Well, they serve people. I kind of alluded to this already, making sure that everyone's physical need is met. And we learned last week in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus uses a form of this word, uh, of deacon, uh, to serve or to minister, it, it's in relation to giving food and drink, it's in relation to shelter and clothes and visiting those in prison. 
So again, it seems to have something to do with the physical needs of the people. And just in summary, and this is a, a, a brief summary because there is some overlap. In, in a sense, elders take care of the spiritual needs of the people and the deacons take care of the physical needs. Now, that's, that's pretty simplistic. It's, it's, it's b- bigger than that. But it, that, that's true. Those statements are true about elders and deacons. And then finally, we began dis- discovering the answer to the third question, which we're going to continue uh, to today and then in the weeks ahead as we continue to look at deacons. And that question was, what are the qualifications of a deacon? And in 1 Timothy 8-13, through 13, par- Paul clearly lays them out. Uh, and to help us summarize those and help me summarize them, maybe more, more than any way, I came up with six uh, headings that summarize those. You can see those on the screen. Deacons are to be respectable. Deacons are to have restraint. Deacons are to retain the faith. Deacons are to be reviewed. Deacons are to be resolute at home. And deacons will be rewarded. And last week, we covered the first two of these headings which talk about the qualifications of deacons. The first one, deacons are to be respectable. Uh, The word is also used in some translation, dignity. They're supposed to be people who are noble. They're revered by the people. They're worthy of people's respect. The people go, I respect that person. If they're going to be a deacon, they need to be respected by the people. And not only are deacons to be respected, we also saw in verse 8, deacons are to have self-restraint or um, self-control in three different areas. Restrain with the tongue, all right, and that was, the, the word is du- not double-tongued, sincere with their tongue. They speak the truth, and, and you can trust what they have to say. Second, they're to be restrained with, uh, from alcohol. All right, it says not, to, not addicted to much wine. That if alcohol is controlling a person, then not, they're, they're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, the rest- restraint with money. Uh, it says not fond of, of sordid gain or dishonest gain. Can't be greedy for money. They can't be in it for money. Because the false teachers are in it for money. We saw that last week. That's why they were serving. That's why they were getting involved in the church because they figured that they could make a little money off this. Uh, we got, got rid of making money off the goddess of Diana, so let's see if we can make the, uh, uh, money off the real God. That was their attitude and their heart. So a deacon can't be like that. And this morning, we're going to be examining the next two main headings that summarize the qualification for deacons, which you can see up there. Deacons are to retain the faith, and deacons are to be reviewed. But before we do that, I I want to remind us that these qualifications, these qualities of, of these people called deacons, aren't just for deacons. They're for any follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, look up there. I mean, wouldn't we all want to be respectable as a follower of Jesus Christ? Shouldn't we all, people who would be noble and worthy of respect? Yes. Wouldn't we all want to, to, to have self-restraint in these areas that I just mentioned? Wouldn't we all want to, to retain the faith which we're going to look at? Yes, we would. all these qualities and qualifications we should all want to grow in as followers of Jesus. So if you're thinking again, hey, this is about deacons, I can check out. Do not check out because I promise you God's word today has something for all of us here to challenge us, to help us grow, to help us love him more, to ma- help us make him known in our world. Uh, so, uh, so I say that and also we've always got to be ready to serve, Right? All of us got to be ready to serve. If we, all of a sudden we can't find the deacons, and we should be able to say anybody in our body, hey, can you help us with this? And the hope is that all of us have a heart. You bet. How can I help? D- don't we all want to be like that? I would think so. All of us do. I just, um, Jason Whittle and I are coaching fifth and sixth grade football team again this year. Our two boys are on the team, and so we're coaching. And, and I had a group of the boys, the, the, like the running backs and receivers and stuff like that, and, and, and Jason took the linemen and so I was teaching them how to get in a three-point stance in football, okay? And you're thinking, what's a three-point stance? So a three-point stance, hope I don't rip my jeans, is like this, okay? Now, you don't laugh, all right? I mean, it's like this. Got my head up. You got to be, you know, a little bit weight forward like that. So we teach them how to get in a three-point stance. And some of the kids are looking, I'm a really wide receiver. Why would I ever want to get down like that? I'm a running back. I'm going to stand back like this. So I had to explain to them, because I could see their looks in their face. Why are we working on a three-point stance? So here's the reason why, because we never know. We don't got 19 boys on the team. We never know when we need somebody to get in there, and you probably will have to play a position that, you, that you're, is not your first position. And everybody needs to get in the three-point, learn how to get three-point stance. You might have to go in at tight end. You might have to, you might have to go on offensive line. We got a guy go down. You got to be able to get in the three-point stance. So I shared a, a, story, a quick story about my oldest son when he was uh, playing. I coached him in sixth grade. He was our quarterback. And we were playing a team, and they, we, we, we were in the third game of the season. We didn't have any problem. We, we go in a shotgun all the time. There's reasons for that at this age, too. It's actually good reasons. Shotgun, we're snapping back there. We can't get the ball back to him. We can't even run our offense. It's terrible. So I put another kid in there. Same thing, another kid. Well, the, de- the, the defensive lineman was just tearing up our, our – just, cu- just cussing at our kids and making them feel bad and calling their mama names and all this kind of stuff, and they just couldn't concentrate. 
So if I had called timeout and I walked out the huddle and I put my son, our quarterback, at center, I said, okay, Josh, you're center. You other guys who try to play center, you come over here with me. We'll put somebody at quarterback. We drove all the way down the field and scored at Joshua at center, who had never played center. Because Joshua was ready. And he learned how to get down in, in the basic stance, all right, of an offensive lineman so he could help our team. And after that, the, the other guy said, now, can you all do this? Yes, sir, I can do it now. I mean, if Joshua could do it, our quarterback, we can do it. Well, the point of that is, is that we always all got to be ready. We all got to know all the plays and all the positions in some ways. Well, we'll just leave the serving to the deacons. That, no, that's not how it's supposed to go. So we all want to be ready, don't we? We all want to know how to... You don't have to get in the three-point stance to be you serve, okay? But we all want to have that kind of attitude. Hey, where do you want to put me? Put me in. Hey, coach, I'm not normally an offensive lineman, but if you need me to go in, I'm in. And I think that's God, how God wants the body of Christ all the time, right? We'll play, what, what position you want me to play, God? I'm in. I have a heart to serve. And we saw that last week. That's what God wants from all of us. And once again, we want to be reminded that, that these characteristics are not something to be worked for, but they're something to be worked out, out of our heart, that is full of God, the Holy Spirit. They're fruit of the Spirit. It's not just something we, we, we go and attain these characteristics. They're things that come out of us because we're rightly related with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's now move on to the next two main headings here and, uh, um, of, of our passage about deacons. And as we do this, we're going to examine each one by, by covering a couple of things. We're going to do observation. What does the text say? What does the Bible say? Okay. Number two, we're going to do explanation. What does it mean? Number three, we're going to do illustration. What does it look like? And then we're going to talk about implications. What is it calling me to? All right? And then the last thing, a lot of people add, and I don't like to add it because it, you don't do that here this morning, application. We do not apply God's word this morning. We apply God's word when we walk out those doors. Have you heard about that? You know, you're, supposed to do, you're supposed to do observation, explanation, app, application is something we do out there, not in here. So we're not going to do application this morning. There's implications of what, how we're supposed to respond to God's word, but we don't do those here this morning. So we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to get to application. We're going to do that when we leave here. With that said, let's examine this third main heading of our passage concerning the qualification of deacons. Deacons are to retain the faith. Notice in verse 9, all right, verse 9 there, that, that phrase, but holding to the mystery of the faith. Some tr translations that say deep truths of the faith. And even more closely, look at that word mystery. All right, the word mystery or deep truths, again, your translation may say it's revealed truth that was previously hidden. Revealed truth that was previously hidden. It's not a mystery anymore, and here's how it's not a mystery anymore. It's been revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what this word mystery means. Those things that were once hidden that are now revealed through Jesus Christ. It's the revealed truth of the Christian faith in the New Testament. It's the full revelation of the new covenant. In summary, it's the gospel. That's what the mystery is, the gospel. It was alluded to in the Old Testament, the, the, the old covenant, but not clearly explained. There's an anticipation of this mystery in the Old Testament, but there's only an explanation of it in the New Testament. Paul uses the word 21 times, this word mystery, 21 times in his writings, 20 of them have to do or, through, implicitly or explicitly. All right? You can't miss it, or hey, if you look at it, yeah, they had to do with the gospel. 20 of the 21 times, you can go look it up. You, that'd be a great study for you. Look up the word mystery used by Paul. 20 of the 21 times he uses it, it's in relation to the gospel somehow. So when we hear this word mystery, oh, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the new promise that would come through Jesus Christ. Look, look at, at the immediate context. You look in your Bibles, or you can look here with me up on the screen. 1 Timothy 3.16, just a few verses down later. We'll be dealing with this in a few weeks. Look what it says. But common, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And listen to this. He who is revealed in the flesh is talking about the mystery. And it's going to tell us, Paul is going to tell us, at least in this context, what is the mystery. He who is revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Who is that speaking of? Jesus. The mystery is the revelation of Jesus Christ and the good news that he brings to our world. That's what the mystery is. And, and, and those are just some of the key truths about Jesus' life and his ministry and his impact. The mystery of the faith is a summary of the New Testament teaching of the gospel, the good news. 
And, and as we've been reminded many times, there's a great summary of the gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Look what Paul writes. He had just mentioned the word gospel in verses 1 and 2 of this passage, and he says in verses 3 and 4, For I delivered you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus had to die and rise again so that we could truly live. We just sang about that, so that I might truly live. We, were who, we as the Bible would say in Ephesians, who were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were separated from God. We needed life, and he had to die for the penalty of our trespasses and sins in order we might be forgiven and be made right with God and given a new heart, which is a promise of the new covenant. And we enter into that rescued, this rescue mission of Jesus. He calls his kingdom by placing our faith in what he has done. We turn from trusting in ourselves and the deceitfulness of sin, and we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, what he did on our behalf. That's how we enter into this rescued kingdom, how we enter into the, the truth of the gospel. And, and if someone's going to serve as a deacon, notice what it says in, in, in verse 9. Look what it says. It says, holding to. It's a solid commitment. It's also in the present tense. Okay, and I've done this, I think, before in other tenses, and you're going, we're going back to English class again. This is so important. It's so important. You're thinking, the you know, old football player is going to teach us about English. This is going to be really fun, all right? It's really important. So you have past tense. You have perfect tense, which is a, is a, is a, is a past action, completed action with a resulting state of being. It never changes. Past tense can change that, that situation, but a perfect tense can't. And then you have future tense, that's something I have. Then you have present tense. And the idea in the New Testament, the present tense, is it just keeps going. It just keeps on going. And here, hold fast, or maybe even better, holding fast or holding to. You keep holding to the mystery of the faith. Not just one time. It's not a one time, hey, yeah, I held to that one time, but I don't anymore. No, 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 no. This is holding fast, a commitment to keep holding, not wavering on the gospel. And we must realize that if we waver at one point in the gospel, listen, it's not the difference between life and death. No big deal, right? It's not the difference between life and death. If we waver on one point of the gospel, it's the difference between eternal life and eternal death. This is serious business, and Paul says if someone is going to serve as a deacon, they cannot waver on the gospel. Not one inch not one millimeter. If there's something smaller, somebody smarter than me, which wouldn't take very much, something smaller than that, one micron, I think that's about as small as I know, you waver on a little bit. It's not the gospel anymore. And Paul's serious. He says, you can't serve as a deacon if you waver on that. You cannot waver on the gospel. Look what Paul writes to the church of Galatians. Most of the, most of the time when Paul writes a letter, he says all these nice things about the church first, not in Galatians. I mean, he gets right to the heart of things. Look what it says. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to the one which we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one received, let him be accursed. For I am not seeking the approval of man or of God. Or for, for, am, for, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, Paul understood there was only one gospel. We are rescued from sin and its consequences by faith alone and Jesus' payment for our sin through his life, death, and burial, and resurrection. That's the only gospel. It's the only good news. To add any work to that is not good news. Think about this. All right? Think about this. We can just go back to the Old Testament. We talk about 613 laws in the Old Testament. All right? And there's one of them, okay? You've got to believe in Jesus, and there's one of them that you have to keep. But I'm not going to tell you which one it is. But you have to keep that to be made right with God and believe the gospel. Whoa. Now, how am I going to know which 613 is the right one to keep? See, that's not the gospel. And that was what had crept into the, the church of Galatia. It was about, yeah, hey, believe in Jesus. That's all good. But also, you've got to do this, 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 and this. What an insult to God by sending his son to Jesus, Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. To say, you know, it wasn't enough, but thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to help you out, God. 
That's what happened in Galatia. It was happening in the church of Ephesus. And not only was it happening then, but it's happening now all over our world. That's not good news. Would you, is that good news? That, hey, you, just, you just keep trying harder. Jesus will help you out a little bit. Well, how hard do I have to try? How many sins am I allowed to commit or not commit? What am I supposed to do? It's not good news. It's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's once delivered. Once delivered. Not twice, once. There's one gospel, and Paul's serious about it. And, and we need to be serious about it because it's the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Now, let me ask this question of all of us here by way of implication. Paul asks in this verse, in verse 10, he says, for, for us, are we seeking the approval of man or of God? Who are we seeking approval from? Are we trying to please man? It's the question that Paul is asking himself and those he's writing to and us. If we're trying to honor God, then we will hold fast to the mystery of the faith, which is the, at the heart of it is the gospel message. We must be willing to offend people with the gospel message. Now, let me say this again. We must be willing to offend people with the gospel message. Let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying be offensive. Don't be just a jerk, all right? But you know what? The gospel message, the first thing you have to understand before you can understand the good news is the bad news. And the bad news is we're sinful and separated from God. And we can do nothing to earn his favor. That's bad news. And some people hearing that say, well, I don't know like that. I mean, get, get uh, uh, upset. We're not, being, we're not trying to be offensive, but the message itself can be offensive. You may have been there before. I was. If you're a Christian, you had to be there. Because you have to start there. So I'm not saying be offensive, um, purpose to be offensive, but just share the story with you. It happened here not too long ago. I was meeting with a young college football coach, and he asked me, he wanted to grow in, 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 in his faith and in, in, in being a Christian. He wanted to grow as a Christian. So we started meeting. We started studying different things, and, and I just noticed he started, he'd come back and say, man, I don't know how, I, I'm just not doing good enough. I'm not doing good enough. I'm really struggling. Brian, would you help me? I'm not doing good enough. And I'm going, I, I just don't think he knows the Lord. I don't think he knows the gospel. And so I asked him, hey, Zach, and he wouldn't mind me telling your name, his name, Zach Grant. All right, he says, hey, Zach, what, who are you trusting in or what are you trusting in to make yourself right with God? And he thought about it for a second. He said, well, I'm just trying to be a good guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to read my Bible and, man, and I'm trying to do better in my relationships with people and I'm trying to not cuss as much and I'm, I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do this. And you know what I said to Zach? I said, Zach, you're not a Christian. Who do I think I am that I would say he's not a Christian? Some of you are like, oh man, I can't believe he said that. It would be the most unloving thing in the world not to tell him the truth. Because he, he was not trusting in Christ, he was trusting in Zach. And he looked right back and he says, you're right, I'm not. You need to trust in what Christ has done on your behalf, not in you. And you know what happened to Zach? He trusted in Christ. And now he's a new creation. He's a brother in Christ. He's brand new. He's been given a new heart. And some of you are still kind of a little shocked that I said that to him. Hey, if we love people and we know they're not trusting in Jesus Christ, it's, it's the worst thing to do not to tell them, you don't know Christ. We want you to know Christ. We've got to be willing to offend or even lose friendships over the fact that somebody doesn't know Christ to tell them the truth. You know, you've got to know Christ. You've got to trust in him. Well, not only are those who serve as deacons to hold firmly to the gospel, but they are to hold firmly to all the major truths that are taught throughout the New Testament about the gospel. The virgin birth, that, God, that Jesus was true, truly God and truly man, that he, was, that he permanently indwells his people through the, through the Holy Spirit, that Jesus' church consists of Jew and Gentile. It's not just one group of people, but all peoples. Jesus is coming again to complete and set up his kingdom. And in order to believe this, all right, we have to believe what God's word says about God's word. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's word is, it's, it is it, scripture is God breathed. It comes from him. It's without error. We've got to believe that before we can believe all these things about who Jesus is and the mystery of the faith. Now look back at verse 9 with me. It says, with a clear conscience. Well, what does this mean? This emphasizes the fact that deacon's life must match up with what they profess to believe. 
Remember that being a Christian is not just believing some information about Jesus, but instead it's a transformation from the inside out. It's not just attaining knowledge, but it's allowing that, those truths to come within and transform us from the inside out. If someone is truly holding to the mystery of the faith, the gospel, then they, they, won't, be re, they won't be reformed. We, we, we send people to places to get reformed, like reform school. No, that's not what the gospel does. It doesn't reform people. It transforms people. It transforms their lives. And you would think that this qualification would be a given. I, I mean, why even bring it up? But Paul emphasizes the fact that deacons and all followers of Jesus must be those who are holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience because the false teachers in Ephesus were not holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. When they believed, what they believed about the gospel was way off, and so was their life. Look what he writes earlier in 1 Timothy. We already saw this, 119. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, they rejected the faith, they rejected a good conscience and suffered shipwrecked in regard to the faith. The false teachers did not keep the faith in a good conscience. And it should be unquestioned as to those who serve as deacons that they may be, what they believe about the gospel and the behavior that flows from being transformed by the gospel. Their creed and their conduct must agree. Well, Paul says this about himself and, and his other um, compatriots in 1 Corinthians 1.12. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that, it, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Paul was exa an example of holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. By God's grace, may that be true of us, that we hold to the truths they're taught us in scripture, but they transform our lives so our creed and our conduct look the same. They don't disqualify us from telling people about the gospel. Well, let's examine the fourth main heading in our passage concerning qualification for deacons. Deacons are to be reviewed. This will be a lot shorter than the first one here we looked at. We see this qualification clearly spelled in verse 10. Look at verse 10 with me. Hold on here. Let's look at verse 10 with me. It says, These men must also first be tested and let them serve as deacons uh, um, if they are beyond reproach. Deacons must be retested. They must be examined. They must be reviewed. And notice the word I have highlighted there also. It's pointing back to elders. Elders needed to be reviewed as well, needed to be tested before they step in that office. And that's what one of the qualifications. They can't be a new convert. They have to be able to walk with the Lord for a while to see their life. Right? That's the word also there. Um, now notice the word tested uh, there in, our, in verse nine, 10. Notice the, it's, a, it's a word when used, when, when testing the genuineness of metal. Sometimes you test the genuineness of metal by fire. You can, there's other tests too, but by fire. Going through some heat to test if it's truly what it is. And, and tested is also in the present tense. That emphasizes an ongoing test, not just one time. Hey, uh, do you love Jesus? Yeah. Uh, do you like people? Yes. Okay, you're in. Okay, it, that's good. There's a start, but let's watch that if they really love Jesus and if they really love people. Over a period of time, it's, it's an ongoing test observing. And after they te the test, they either become deacons or not become deacons. Maybe they need more time. It, it all depends on what is discovered from the time of testing. Now notice the end of verse 10. Um, what Paul says needs to be true of a person if they're going to serve as a deacon, if they are above reproach. This is the same word used for elders, which we'll see in Titus 1, 6 and 7. It, and it's also a synonym for verse 2 of elders here. And some of your translations will actually say, must be above reproach. It's, it's, it's a different word, but it means the same thing. Right? It means that one's character needs to be without any major blights, free from accusation. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't, they can't be accused of something. But if you remember back to our time of elders, it's like a Teflon plant, pan. Right, a Teflon pan, you throw something on a Teflon pan and it slides right off. So they can be accused, but it won't stick. Right, so they, they need to be above reproach. The testing shows, you know what, after a t certain time that they're above reproach. People can throw accusations, but they just don't stick. Their life holds up to the scrutiny. Well, let me show you one of the major reasons a deacon must be tested. Look at Romans 5, 3 through 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces a character, and character produces hope. Pe Let me make this statement. People follow people who give them hope. Don't you like to pe follow people who give you hope? I, I like to follow people who give me hope. They're not all doomed. Hey, there's hope. We, we, let's go. All right? So how does 
a person get hope? Well, let's take this verse backward. Let's trail it backward. And, and <clears throat> hope comes from what? Character. Character comes from endurance. Endurance comes from suffering. So hope comes from being tested by suffering and growing through it. As my good friend Sean Hill, one of our deacons actually here, he, he's not here this morning, uh, says this about this passage, about this idea about someone who has hope and they've, gone, they, they, they've suffered. He says, you want to follow someone who's been through something. You want to follow people who've been through something. Not everything's been rosy in their life. They've been through something. My, my mentor and the man most um, impactful in my life, outside of my own dad, a guy named Bob Warren, used to say this, never trust a man who doesn't limp. Never trust a man who doesn't limp. Never trust a man who hasn't been through a difficult time and been tested and been stronger for it. And that's why it's important for deacons to be tested. If they pass the test, we'll want to follow them, right? If you see they've suffered and they've been through something and they've got hope, they rejoice in their sufferings because now they have hope. They hope in Jesus. They hope in his promise. They hope is what to come, what he's going to do in and through them. Hey, I'll, I'll follow somebody like that. That's why it's so important. Paul says they must be tested. Uh, what I think about God um, uh, and how he's built me and how he's made me the man I am today, and I hope he keeps building me and growing me and maturing me and sanctifying me, but I, I think about being tested through suffering, different suffering times in my life, and but I'll tell you one, since, since I was a little boy, started playing football at eight years old, I played offensive tackle at that time. I was as wide as I was tall, and they put me on the line, and, and I just fell in love with the game. And from that point on, I wanted to play in the NFL when I was eight years old. And then God let my dream come true. And I graduated from college, and I got to sign as a free, rookie free agent with the Atlanta Falcons. And I went, I went to Atlanta, and I, all just great stuff happened, and my, my, my locker was right around the corner from Brett Favre, who was a rookie with me at the Atlanta Falcons. Most people forget that. He, he was Atlanta, and then, then right around there was Deion Sanders and all these guys. I, oh, my goodness. Well, Brett Favre was a rookie with me. He wasn't a Hall of Famer yet, but I mean, just all these guys, and wow, and I'm here, and I got on the field, began to practice, and things were going well, and, um, and then we got into late July, right about this, well, a few weeks before this, and I destroyed my shoulder. I, had a career, I was there for 15 weeks. Sean played 15 years in the NFL. I played 15 weeks. There's a big difference, but I, my, my dream was crushed. And, I, and I, I knew Jesus at the time, and I thought he was going to give me this platform. I was going to be able to speak all over the country about Jesus because people were going to bring me in because I played in the NFL, and I'm so excited about this, and boom, it was gone like that. And I went home. after I did surgery. I went home, and I was rehabbing, and I just was at a loss. God, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? That was my, that was my dream. I, and, and you gave me my dream, and now it's gone. And, and, I, and I reached out to this guy named Bob Warren, who I'd met at a college retreat, an FCA college retreat a few years earlier. And I knew this guy really loved Jesus. And he'd played nine years in the old ABA and then the NBA. And, and when he got traded to New York, that team folded. So I thought he'd probably understand you know, a little bit. So I called him, and he said, hey, Brian, I want you to do something. What do you have to do? And I said, well, I'll do rehab twice a day. That's about it. And I'm in a big sling. I couldn't do anything. And he said, I want you to do, I want you to take the book of Genesis and I want you to read it in one setting from start to finish. And, and, and then when you're done with that, take Exodus, start to finish. Don't stop, just read it. Sit down and read it. And then look at it all the way. And when you're done with the Bible, all right, don't look for any, just soup, some specific little thing. Just look at how God's been faithful to his people. So in about two months, after I'd finished that, and said, hey, you read the Bible in two months? Hey, that's pretty slow. That's all I had to do. All right, was just read the Bible. At the end of that, I saw God was faithful to his people, and I knew he'd be faithful to me, and it gave me hope. But I wouldn't have built, developed that hope if it wasn't for the suffering. And God used that to build and give me a foundation in his word like never before. I'm so thankful for that time. But it came through suffering. And if we're going to grow in hope, so people who want to follow all of us in service, we're going to have to go through some stuff, and I know many of you have. Well, how can we respond to God's word this morning? Are we holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience? Do our creed and our conduct connect? Are we wavering on the gospel at all? Do we read and study and live out God's word as if it is truly God-breathed? Are we allowing testing and suffering our lives to produce hope that leads to being above reproach? Well, I'd ask us all to pray and ask God to grow us in these areas so that our words and our walk match up 
So when we share the life-transforming message of the gospel, people will believe it. So it, it must be believable. Look what happened to them. And God would use that to change their heart. And this morning, have you embraced that message of the gospel? Have you embraced the message that although you're sinful and separated from him, he sent Jesus to die in your place so you could be reconciled to him, made right with him, be his friend, be, be his son or daughter. You do that by trusting in his finished work through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you haven't done that, our prayer is you do that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how clear it is, Lord, and we thank you for the gospel, the good news, how good it is. We pray that you would empower all of us to hold, keep holding on to the gospel, the mystery of the faith, and do it with a clear conscience that you would transform us from the inside out so our life displays that we've been changed by you. And Lord, that we would that we would embrace, as it Paul said in Romans, suffering, that we would rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that you're going to use it to produce endurance and improving character, and then ultimately hope. Well, we want to give people hope, but Lord, use the difficulties in our life to bring hope to us, hope in you, hope in your promises, hope in the person of Jesus Christ. We'd ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen.